The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 13 Quote, I'll Seek a Readier Path, Unquote, by Purnell. The route taken by Hawkeye lay across those sandy plains, relieved by occasional valleys and swells of land, which had been traversed by their party on the morning of the same day, with the baffled Magua for their guide. The sun had now fallen, low toward the distant mountains, and as their journey lay through the interminable forest, the heat was no longer oppressive. Their progress, in consequence, was proportionate, and long before the twilight gathered about them, they had made good many toilsome miles of their return. The hunter, like the savage whose place he filled, seemed to select among the blind signs of their wild route, with a species of instinct, seldom abating his speed, and never pausing to deliberate. A rapid and oblique glance at the moss of the trees, with an occasional upward gaze toward the setting sun, or a steady but passing look at the direction of the numerous watercourses through which he waded, were sufficient to determine his path, and remove his greatest difficulties. In the meantime, the forest began to change its hues, losing that lively green which had embellished its arches, in the graver light which is the usual precursor of the close of day. While the eyes of the sisters were endeavoring to catch glimpses through the trees of the flood of golden glory which formed a glittering halo around the sun, tinging here and there with ruby streaks, or bordering with narrow edgings of shining yellow, a mass of clouds that lay piled at no great distance above the western hills. Hawkeye turned suddenly, and pointing toward the gorgeous heavens, he spoke. "'Yonder is the signal given to man to seek his food and natural rest,' he said. "'Better and wiser would it be if he could understand the signs of nature, and take a lesson from the fowls of the air and the beast of our field. Our night, however, will soon be over, for with the moon we must be up and moving again. I remember to have fought the Maquas hereways in the first war in which I ever drew blood from a man, and we threw up a work of blocks to keep the ravenous varmints from handling our scalps. If my marks do not fail me, we shall find the place a few rods further to our left. Without waiting for an assent, or, indeed, for any reply, the sturdy hunter moved boldly into a dense thicket of young chestnuts, shoving aside the branches of the exuberant shoots, which nearly covered the ground, like a man who expected at each step to discover some object he had formerly known. The recollection of the scout did not deceive him. After penetrating through the brush, matted as it was with briars for a few hundred feet, he entered an open space, that surrounded a low green hillock, which was crowned by the decayed blockhouse in question. This rude and neglected building was one of those deserted works, which, having been thrown up on an emergency, had been abandoned with the disappearance of danger, and was now quietly crumbling in the solitude of the forest, neglected and nearly forgotten, like the circumstances which had caused it to be reared. Such memorials of the passage and struggles of man are yet frequent throughout the broad barrier of wilderness, which once separated the hostile provinces, and form a species of ruins that are intimately associated with the recollections of colonial history, and which are in appropriate keeping with the gloomy character of the surrounding scenery. The roof of bark had long since fallen, and mingled with the soil, but the huge logs of pine, which had been hastily thrown together, still preserved their relative positions, though one angle of the work had given way under the pressure, and threatened a speedy downfall to the remainder of the rustic edifice. While Hayward and his companions hesitated to approach a building so decayed, Hawkeye and the Indians entered within the low walls, not only without fear, but with obvious interest. While the former surveyed the ruins, both internally and externally, with the curiosity of one whose recollections 
were reviving at each moment. Chingachgook related to his son in the language of the Delawares, and with the pride of a conqueror, the brief history of the skirmish which had been fought in his youth in that secluded spot. A strain of melancholy, however, blended with his triumph, rendering his voice, as usual, soft and musical. In the meantime, the sisters gladly dismounted and prepared to enjoy their halt in the coolness of the evening, and in a security which they believed nothing but the beast of the forest could invade. "'Would not our resting-place have been more retired, my worthy friend?' demanded the more vigilant Duncan, perceiving that the scout had already finished his short survey. "'Had we chosen a spot less known, and one more rarely visited than this?' "'Few live who know the blockhouse was ever raised,' was the slow, amusing answer. "'Tis not often that books are made, and narratives written, of such a scrimmage as was fought between the Mohicans and Mohawks in a war of their own waging. I was then a Yonker, and went out with the Delawares, because I knowed they were a scandalized and wrong race. Forty days and forty nights did the imps crave our blood around this pile of logs, which I designed and partly reared. Being, as you'll remember, no Indian myself, but a man without a cross. The Delawares lent themselves to the work, and we made it good, ten to twenty, until our numbers were nearly equal, and then we sallied out upon the hounds, and not a man of them ever got back to tell the fate of his party. Yes, yes, I was then young and new to the sight of blood, and not relishing the thought that creatures who had spirits like myself should lay on the naked ground to be torn asunder by beast, or to bleach in the rains. I buried the dead with my own hands under that very little hillock where you have placed yourselves. And no bad seat does it make either, though it be raised by the bones of mortal men. Hayward and the sisters arose on the instant from the grassy sepulchre, nor could the two later, notwithstanding the terrific scenes they had so recently passed through, entirely suppress an emotion of natural horror when they found themselves in such familiar contact with the grave of the dead Mohawks. The gray light, the gloomy little area of dark grass, surrounded by its border of brush, beyond which the pines rose, in breathing silence, apparently into the very clouds, and the death-like stillness of the vast forest, were all in unison to deepen such a sensation. They are gone, and they are harmless, continued Hawkeye, waving his hand with a melancholy smile, at their manifest alarm. They'll never shout the war-hoop, nor strike a blow with the tomahawk again. And of all those who aided in placing them where they lie, Chingachgook and I only are living. The brothers and family of the Mohican formed our war-party, and you see before you all that are now left of his race. The eyes of the listeners involuntarily sought the forms of the Indians, with a compassionate interest in their desolate fortune. Their dark persons were still to be seen within the shadows of the blockhouse, the son listening on the relation of his father with that sort of intenseness which would be created by a narrative that redounded so much to the honor of those whose names he had long revered for their courage and savage virtues. "'I had thought the Delawares a Pacific people,' said Duncan." and that they never waged war in person, trusting the defense of their hands to those very Mohawks that you slew. "'Tis true, in part,' returned the scout, "'and yet at the bottom tis a wicked lie. Such a treaty was made in ages gone by through the deviltries of the Dutchers, who wished to disarm the natives that had the best right to the country where they had settled themselves. The Mohicans though a part of the same nation, having to deal with the English, never entered into the silly bargain, but kept to their manhood, as in truth did the Delawares when their eyes were opened to their folly. You see before you a chief of the great Mohican Sagamores. Once his family could chase their deer over tracts of country wider than which belongs to the Albany Pateroon, without crossing brook or hill that was not their own. But what is left of their descendant? 
he may find his six feet of earth when God chooses, and keep it in peace, perhaps, if he has a friend who will take the pains to sink his head so low that the plowshares cannot reach it. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive that the subject might lead to a discussion that would interrupt the harmony so necessary to the preservation of his fair companions. We have journeyed far, and few among us are blessed with forms like that of yours, which seems not to know neither fatigue nor weakness. The sinews and bones of a man carry me through it all, said the hunter, surveying his muscular limbs with a simplicity that betrayed the honest pleasure the compliment afforded him. There are larger and heavier men to be found in the settlements, but you might travel many days in a city before you could meet one able to walk fifty miles without stopping to take breath, or who has kept the hounds within hearing during a chase of hours. However, as flesh and blood are not always the same, it is quite reasonable to suppose that the gentle ones are willing to rest after all they have seen and done this day. Uncas, clear out the spring while your father and I make a cover for their tender heads of these chestnut shoots and a bed of grass and leaves. The dialogue ceased, while the hunter and his companions busied themselves in preparations for the comfort and protection of those they guided, a spring which many long years before had induced the natives to select the place for their temporary fortification, was soon cleared of leaves, and a fountain of crystal gushed from the bed, diffusing its waters over the verdant hillock. A corner of the building was then roofed in such a manner as to exclude the heavy dew of the climate, and piles of sweet shrubs and dried leaves were laid beneath it for the sisters to repose on. While the diligent woodsmen were employed in this manner, Cora and Alice partook of that refreshment which duty required much more than inclination prompted them to accept. They then retired within the walls, and first offering up their thanksgiving for past mercies, and petitioning for continuance of the divine favor throughout the coming night, they laid their tender forms on the fragrant couch, and in spite of recollections and forebodings, soon sank into those slumbers which nature so imperiously demanded, and which were sweetened by hopes of the morrow. Duncan had prepared himself to pass the night in watchfulness near them, just without the ruin, but the scout, perceiving his intention, pointed toward Chingachgook, as he coolly disposed his own person on the grass, and said, The eyes of a white man are too heavy and too blind for such a watch as this. The Mohican will be our sentinel. Therefore let us sleep. I proved myself a sluggard on my post during the past night, said Hayward, and have less need of repose than you, who did more credit to the character of a soldier. Let all the party seek their rest, then, while I hold the guard. If we lay among the white tents of the sixtieth, and in front of an enemy like the French, I could not ask for a better watchman, returned the scout. But in the darkness and among the signs of the wilderness, your judgment will be like the folly of a child, and your vigilance thrown away. Do, then, like Uncas and myself, sleep, and sleep in safety. Hayward perceived, in truth, that the younger Indian had thrown his form on the side of the hillock while they were talking, like one who sought to make the most of the time allotted to rest, and that his example had been followed by David, whose voice literally clove to his jaws with the fever of his wound, heightened as it was by their toilsome march. Unwilling to prolong a useless discussion, the young man affected to comply, by posting his back against the logs of the blockhouse, in a half-recumbent posture, though resolutely determined in his own mind not to close an eye until he had delivered his precious charge into the arms of Monroe himself. Hawkeye, believing he had prevailed, soon fell asleep, and a silence as deep as the solitude in which they had found it pervaded the retired spot. For many minutes Duncan succeeded in keeping his senses on the alert, and alive to every moaning sound that arose from the forest. His vision became more acute as the shades of evening settled on the place, 
and even after the stars were glimmering above his head, he was able to distinguish the recumbent forms of his companions, as they lay stretched on the grass, and to note the person of Chingachgook, who sat upright and motionless as one of the trees which formed the dark barrier on every side. He still heard the breathings of the sisters, who lay within a few feet of him, and not a leaf was ruffled by the passing air of which his ear did not detect the whispering sound. At length, however, the mournful notes of a whippoorwill became blended with the moanings of an owl. His heavy eyes occasionally sought the bright rays of the stars, and he then fancied he saw them through the fallen lids. At instants of momentary wakefulness he mistook a bush for his associate sentinel. His head next sank upon his shoulder, which in its turn sought the support of the ground and finally his whole person became relaxed and pliant, and the young man sank into a deep sleep, dreaming that he was a knight of ancient chivalry, holding his midnight vigils before the tent of a recaptured princess, whose favor he did not despair of gaining by such a proof of devotion and watchfulness. How long the tired Duncan lay in this insensible state he never knew himself, but his slumbering visions had been long lost in total forgetfulness when he was awakened by a light tap on the shoulder. Aroused by this signal, slight as it was, he sprang upon his feet with a confused recollection of the self-imposed duty he had assumed with the commencement of the night. "'Who comes?' he demanded, feeling for his sword at the place where it was usually suspended. "'Speak!' "'Friend or enemy?' "'Friend,' replied the low voice of Chingachgook, who, pointing upward at the luminary, which was shedding its mild light through the opening in the trees directly above their bivouac, immediately added in his rude English, "'Moon comes, and white man's fort, far, far off. Time to move, when sleep shuts both eyes of the Frenchman. "'You say true. Call up your friends.' and bridle the horses, while I prepare my own companions for the march. "'We are awake, Duncan,' said the soft silvery tones of Alice within the building, "'and ready to travel very fast, after so refreshing a sleep. But you have watched through the tedious night in our behalf, after having endured so much fatigue the live-long day.' "'Say, rather, I would have watched.' But my treacherous eyes betrayed me. Twice have I proved myself unfit for the trust I bear. Nay, Duncan, deny it not, interrupted the smiling Alice, issuing from the shadows of the building into the light of the moon, in all the loveliness of her fresh and beauty. I know you to be a heedless one, when self is the object of your care, but too vigilant in favor of others. Can we not tarry here a little longer, while you find the rest you need? Cheerfully, most cheerfully, will Cora and I keep the vigils, while you and all these brave men endeavor to snatch a little sleep? If shame could cure me of my drowsiness, I should never close an eye again, said the uneasy youth, gazing at the ingenuous countenance of Alice, where, however, in its sweet solicitude. He read nothing to confirm his half-awakened suspicion. It is but true that after leading you into danger by my heedlessness, I have not even the merit of guarding your pillows, as should become a soldier. No one but Duncan himself should accuse Duncan of such a weakness. Go, then, and sleep. Believe me, neither of us weak girls as we are will betray our watch. The young man was relieved from the awkwardness of making any further protestations of his own demerits by an exclamation from Chingachgook, and the attitude of riveted attention assumed by his son. "'The Mohicans hear an enemy,' whispered Hawkeye, who, by this time, in common with the whole party, was awake and stirring. "'They scent danger in the wind.' "'God forbid!' exclaimed Hayward. Surely we have had enough of bloodshed. While he spoke, however, the young soldier seized his rifle 
and advancing toward the front, prepared to atone for his venial remissness by freely exposing his life in defense of those he attended. "'Tis some creature of the forest, prowling around us, in quest of food," he said in a whisper, as soon as the low and apparently distant sounds which had startled the Mohicans reached his own ears. Psst! returned the attentive scout. "'Tis man! Even I can now tell his tread. Poor as my senses are when compared to an Indian's. That scampering Huron has fallen in with one of Montcalm's outlying parties, and they have struck upon our trail. I shouldn't like myself to spill more human blood in this spot, he added, looking around with anxiety in his features at the dim objects by which he was surrounded. But what must be, must. Lead the horses into the blockhouse. Uncas and friends, do you follow to the same shelter? Poor and old as it is, it offers a cover, and is rung with the crack of a rifle afore to-night. He was instantly obeyed, the Mohicans leading the Narragansetts within the ruin, whither the whole party repaired with the most guarded silence. The sound of approaching footsteps were now too distinctly audible to leave any doubts as to the nature of the interruption. They were soon mingled with voices calling to each other in an Indian dialect, which the hunter, in a whisper, affirmed to Hayward, was the language of the Hurons. When the party reached the point where the horses had entered the thicket which surrounded the blockhouse, they were evidently at fault, having lost those marks which, until that moment, had directed their pursuit. It would seem by the voices that twenty men were soon collected at that one spot, mingling their different opinions and advice in noisy clamor. "'The knaves know our weaknesses,' whispered Hawkeye, who stood by the side of Hayward, in deep shade, looking through an opening in the logs. "'Or they wouldn't indulge their idleness in such a squall's march. Listen to the reptiles. Each man among them seems to have two tongues, and but a single leg. Duncan, brave as he was in the combat, could not, in such a moment of painful suspense, make any reply to the cool and characteristic remark of the scout. He only grasped his rifle more firmly, and fastened his eyes upon the narrow opening through which he gazed upon the moonlight view with increasing anxiety. The deeper tones of one who spoke as having authority were next heard, amid a silence that denoted the respect with which his orders, or rather advice, was received, after which, by the rustling of leaves and crackling of dried twigs, it was apparent that the savages were separating in pursuit of the lost trail. Fortunately for the pursued, the light of the moon, while it shed a flood of wild luster upon the little area about the ruin, was not sufficiently strong to penetrate the deep arches of the forest where the object still lay in deceptive shadow. The search proved fruitless, for so short and sudden had been the passage from the faint path the travelers had journeyed into the thicket, that every trace of their footsteps was lost in the obscurity of the woods. It was not long, however, before the restless savages were heard beating the brush, and gradually approaching the inner edge of that dense border of young chestnuts which encircled the little area. "'They are coming,' muttered Hayward, endeavoring to thrust his rifle through the chink in the logs. "'Let us fire upon their approach.' "'Keep everything in the shade,' returned the scout. "'The snapping of a flint, or even the smell of a single carnal of brimstone, would bring the hungry varlets upon us in a body. Should it please God that we must give battle for the scalps, trust to the experience of men.' who know the ways of the savages, and who are not often backward when the war-hoop is howled. Duncan cast his eyes behind him, and saw that the trembling sisters were cowering in the far corner of the building, while the Mohicans stood in the shadow like two upright posts, ready, and apparently willing, to strike when the blow should be needed. Curbing his impatience, he again looked out upon the area, and awaited the result in silence. 
At that instant the thicket opened, and a tall and armed Huron advanced a few paces into the open space. As he gazed upon the silent blockhouse, the moon fell upon his swarthy countenance, and betrayed its surprise and curiosity. He made the exclamation which usually accompanies the former emotion of an Indian, and, calling in a low voice, soon drew a companion to his side. These children of the woods stood together for several moments, pointing at the crumbling edifice, and conversing in the unintelligible language of their tribe. They then approached, though with slow and cautious steps, pausing every instant to look at the building, like startled deer whose curiosity struggled powerfully with their awakened apprehensions for the mastery. The foot of one of them suddenly rested on the mound, and he stopped to examine its nature. At this moment Hayward observed that the scout loosened his knife in its sheath, and lowered the muzzle of his rifle. Imitating these movements, the young man prepared himself for the struggle, which now seemed inevitable. The savages were so near that the least motion in one of the horses, or even a breath louder than common, would have betrayed the fugitives. But. In discovering the character of the mound, the attention of the Hurons appeared directed to a different object. They spoke together, and the sound of their voices were low and solemn, as if influenced by a reverence that was deeply blended with awe. Then they drew warily back, keeping their eyes riveted on the ruin, as if they expected to see the apparitions of the dead issue from its silent walls until having reached the boundary of the area, they moved slowly into the thicket and disappeared. Hawkeye dropped the breech of his rifle to the earth, and drawing a long free breath, exclaimed in an audible whisper, Ay, they respect the dead, and it has this time saved their own lives, and it may be the lives of better men, too. Hayward lent his attention for a single moment to his companion, but without replying, he again turned toward those who had just then interested him more. He heard the two Hurons leave the bushes, and it was soon plain that all the pursuers were gathered about them, in deep attention of their report. After a few minutes of earnest and solemn dialogue, altogether different from the noisy clamor with which they had first collected about the spot, the sounds grew fainter and more distant, and finally were lost in the depths of the forest. Hawkeye waited until a signal from the listening Chinchkochkuk assured him that every sound from the retiring party was completely swallowed by the distance, when he motioned to Hayward to lead forth the horses and to assist the sisters into their saddles. The instant this was done, they issued through the broken gateway, and stealing out by a direction opposite to the one by which they entered, they quitted the spot, the sisters casting furtive glances at the silent grave and crumbling ruin, as they left the soft light of the moon to bury themselves in the gloom of the woods. End of chapter 13